Greetings everyone and welcome back to Joe's Metal Man Cave. Today I decided to do something a little bit different where instead of doing a typical collection update, I'm going to basically show you uh, my entire collection from a specific band. And the first band to get the treatment is Agalock. If you're watching this, I'm assuming you know who Agalock is, but a brief history would go a little bit like this. Uh, they formed in 1995 and eventually broke up in 2016. Uh, they were from Portland, Oregon, and they were, in my opinion, a very hard band to really uh, describe or place a genre tag on. A lot of people pretty much called them post-black metal, and they, for what it's worth, they were probably one of the most influential bands in that scene. But uh, as the years have passed, and I've kind of come to really re-examine everything, uh, there was a very, actually just minuscule amount of black metal in their music. It was mostly just in the vocal style, and uh, the actual black metal riffs in their music was pretty few and far between. So what ultimately kind of made Agalock interesting, though, is that they were a very diverse, very avant-garde band. I mean, uh, of course, as I already said, there was certain traces of black metal in their music, but there was also a very notable post-rock and post-metal sound. There was a doomish quality, maybe a little gothicish here and there. There was dark ambient and noise characteristics. There was a neo-folk and acoustic music characteristics, and just uh, they had a style that just sort of intermingled all of that, and you know, not necessarily always in the same track or whatever, but the Throughout their catalog, they had a very diverse sound, and all these sounds were sometimes, you know, were in a single album or just, you know, in a single EP or, you know, even sometimes in a, a single song. It was, it was really diverse, and what they did was really special and unique. And uh, I got into Agalock way back in December of 2000. Uh, at that time, the only thing they had released was their demo tapes and their first album, Pale Folklore. And, what was interesting too about Agalock is that I followed them throughout the years and it was just so interesting seeing them develop and just become increasingly diverse and you know ultimately becoming just a very important and just huge legendary band in the you know black metal or just you know heavy metal underground in general. So having been into the band since December of 2000 I have naturally acquired all their albums as well as some of the special editions and you know now out of print uh, EPs and vinyls and uh, I don't know everything I don't, uh, which is a bit of a shame. I mean, I I guess I never really, like, collected the band, per se. I just sort of built a big collection out of them just because I enjoyed their music so much. And uh, there is actually two rare releases uh, from their early catalog that I used to have and I sold, which uh, one of those being the original demo tape from Witch of this Oak, which I bought uh, shortly after I got into the band for $10 on eBay. So it probably would have been early 2001. And uh, years later I sold it, but it, uh, I regret it, but it, it helped fund uh, a trip to Finland, so that was kind of cool. And I also used to have uh, a seven inch record that they released right after the Mantle, which that too, I think I ended up selling for like $80 or something years later. And you know, I wish I would have kept it, but again, it helped fund a very cool trip to Finland. So uh, regrets, but not entirely. So with that being said, how I'm gonna basically to do this is just show uh, the albums as they were released and just show you what I have from my collection and then just kind of talk about it and just share some thoughts basically. And then to conclude the video I'm going to show some of the projects that Agalock was doing during the band's existence, uh, some stuff before and even some stuff that came afterwards. So uh, this is uh, my Agalock collection, I hope you enjoy it. Well then, haven't already mentioned the From Which of This Oak demo tape that was originally released in 1996. We have the vinyl reissue here to talk about first. Um, originally released in 1996, this uh, vinyl pressing came in 2009. As far as I recall, I picked this up uh, on one of the two times I saw the band live. So, um, from which of this oak kind of shows Agalock and probably their most Scandinavian influenced black metal style. There's, you know, again, definitely some black metal riffs here, but it's more probably melodic, death metal, black metal, it, it's hard to describe and you know for something released in 1996 it's really unique and I mean had the band just released this I think this would have been uh, a demo that years later would have gotten repressed anyway because it, it is fantastic. Um, 
One of the songs as Ember's Dress the Sky got re-recorded for uh, Pale Folk, and it's one of my favorite songs. There's also a song called This Old Cabin, and I believe some of the riffs in that uh, kind of feel like they're uh, in Pale Folk folklore as well. And then there's a song, The Wilderness, which is, God, just one of the coolest songs Igloch ever did, and I absolutely love it, but they just, they never uh, re-recorded it, which was a bit of a shame. It's just a phenomenal song. So, on this vinyl person we have uh, some Gustav Dore artwork. There's the back cover of that. Then this uh, vinyl reissue here comes as a picture disc. And, uh, a kind of interesting thing to note here too is that in these earlier days, Agalock had, you know, more of a black metal image. You know, there's John Hom with uh, gauntlet, it's a bullet belt, and a, what appears to be uh, some sort of medieval sword or saber. And the on the other side of the vinyl here, there's a picture of uh, Don Anderson looking a little melancholy at the lake. And, you know, again, you can see he's uh, got the spiky bracers on and stuff like that. So, yeah, super cool. And then uh, this one also comes with a poster of the cover artwork, which I've sort of always been meaning to get framed and put in my wall, but I just never got around to it. So I have that upside down. There's the poster. And then... Uh, I don't remember why, I think uh, because I wanted to have those songs on CD as well, I got this, the Demonsta Demonstration Archive, which again has uh, the From Which of This Oak demo, as well as the promo 1998, which was a promo tape the band released, which was specifically just for labels and magazines at the time. So you get those songs as well. So you get another a couple songs that would later on appear on Pale Local, and it's, it's just... At least for me, when it, I, a band I really love, it's really interesting hearing those more, I guess, like primordial and early drafts of songs. And it, even the, the, the demo versions were really interesting, really cool, and really well done. But uh, ultimately, yeah, I mean, the versions that were on uh, Pale Folklore were the more superior versions. But yeah. Trey card there. I'm gonna take a look at the booklet, which. We have some of the same images from the LP. Yep, There's some of the same ones. And again, you know, you see this more black metal, Scandinavian black metal influenced look. And I mean, obviously later on, <laughs> I think it's always kind of silly, but one of the things that kind of Agalock was noted for was like not looking metal or something like that. It was always like, oh, hey, like they have short hair and they wear like pea coats and stuff like that. And, that was like a thing or something like oh, but as <laughs> stupid as it is uh yeah people said that back in the day i remember like when the mantle came out people were like oh well they're, they're black metal but they don't look black metal and i think that's uh partially what later on you know kind of started the trend where like black metal bands just you know wouldn't look black metal so anyway that's uh Agalock's early years from the 90s and the from much of this oak and the promo 98 Continuing on, we come to June of 1999, and Agalock has just released their debut album, Pale Folklore. Um, Pale Folklore, to me, is an album that will always have a very, very deep, special meaning, because it was a period of my life when I was very depressed. And uh, it, it it's weird, because I've always had this sort of connection to depressive music, where, like, if I'm feeling really dep depressed and I listen to depressed music, it sort of gives me some sort of comfort knowing that other people in this world have the you know same problems that I have. And uh, this was a record that just really resonated with me deeply. And uh, considering the fact that I discovered it in December of 2000, um, it was a perfect timing. And uh, actually, the very first time I heard Agalock was on a the End Records compilation, which I believe had the song Dead Winter Days. I had heard the song and I was like, well, I gotta get this album. This was so great. And uh, the first time I actually heard this album, though, I was, I, put, I had put it in my CD Walkman and I was walking to uh, catch the bus to go down to my college courses and almost as if it synced up with the snow field recording in the album, it started snowing outside. It was like, it, it was like this most just like peculiar thing. Like, like these two albums in the seasons just suddenly linked up and I was just like wow like I, I didn't know like if what I saw coming from the sky was the sound or actually the sound on the album it was it was really just a, a incredible feeling I guess to say the least and I, I think I knew right then and there this was going to be an album and a band that I was going to love for a very long time to come 
So the, the album kicks off with She Painted Fire Across the Skyline, and it's right away from the get-go. You get to see that Egglock had a very unique sound. Uh, even on this first album, you know, as I said, some sort of mishmash of, like, uh, post-black metal with, like, uh, some sort of doom characteristics. I remember when this album first came out, people didn't know what the hell to say about it. Some people were like, well, it kind of sounds like early Overt, it kind of sounds like Catatonia, and, uh, there's something else in there, like Fate's Warning or something. You know, something I can just grab, they just said a random progressive metal band's name, but, uh, that's sort of one way to describe this album. It's, of course, not nearly as aggressive as uh, the early Ulv or, or even the, you know, uh, as maybe the same sort of heavy doomness as early Catatonia, but I think those influencers are definitely there. Uh, some years after this album came out, I had read an interview with the guys where they said uh, the early Cure stuff was actually influence on them too, so it, it's just interesting that, you know, uh, you know, just because you're in a metal band, you don't necessarily always have to be influenced by metal, and that was surely the case with Agalock. But, uh, yeah, it's always been a very, very special album for me. I, I absolutely love every song on it, and Agalock, of course, uh, because of when I discovered them, have, has become a very, you know, uh, wintry and autumn band for me, I guess. I really only listened to them during those uh, times of years, and it just uh, seems perfect to me. I always, uh... I always really like the album cover too. It's just the uh, the wood grain with the gold logo. Really cool stuff. Nice nature photography with the gold lettering for everything. And again, already by this first album, we kind of see that the image has changed. You know, it's more it's just kind of melancholy look. The, the spiky bracers are gone and stuff like that. And the swords. You know, uh, of course, Don Anderson cut his hair short at that point. If, you know, it, it, really interesting. You know. So yeah, and there's that, and then, uh, of course, uh, when the reissue of Pell Folklore came back in, oh gosh, what was that? I don't recall that. The reissue on the Infinite Vinyl series came, which, or an Infinite Vinyl series and Profound Lore, the reissue, I just I had to have this. And I recently started, like, cataloging all my stuff on uh, Discogs, and I was surprised at this stuff, like, a lot of these old, uh, Igalock vinyls are going for like 200 plus dollars in mint condition. I mean, I've played this vinyl version several times and I have no intentions to sell it, of course, but uh, nevertheless, it's just interesting, you know, um, that's something I have in my collection is so expensive. So uh, basically the same album cover is a little bit darker wood grain and uh, logo, but it's not gold, so it look different. In the back cover with all of the, the track listing. Here's the inside of the vinyl. And then, if I'm not mistaken, oh yeah, this has uh, more pictures of the band here. Same, or similar ones that are into, in the booklet of the CD. The landscape shots. I can't remember if this is a black vinyl or... Oh, sorry, this is the blue vinyl. Yeah, definitely uh, pretty cool. Let's put this down, I think, also. That's a double vinyl, so that's uh, really cool, obviously. And then here we go. You know, another just a variation or another you know outtake from the original photographs that were found in the booklet. And yeah, another blue vinyl here. Yeah, pale folklore. Right? It's uh, it's an album. I think, in as far as their whole discography is concerned, it is probably the album that's most near and dear to my heart and I think it's just because it it was the first album I heard from them and sometimes when you just yeah, you become a huge fan of a band just sometimes that first album is just the one that sticks with you uh, throughout all time and as much as I love the albums that would follow this album uh, the sound just the mood and the atmosphere is just very unique very special and again I just kind of always link it to that time period in my life where I was unbelievably depressed and just kind of how uh, in a weird sort of way, this impressive music kind of saved me. So anyway, that's uh, that's Igalock's Pale Folklore. Following Pale Folklore, in May of 2001, the band released Of Stone, Wind, and Pillar, which was basically an EP that uh, featured two brand new songs as well as basically uh, an unreleased 7-inch record that was supposed to be released in 1998. 
So, uh, even though it was new to everyone hearing it, it was not by any means new material to the band. So, uh, on the front cover we have another Gustav Doré painting, and some of the stuff that is uh, featured here would also, uh, you know, be featured on uh, those uh, demo compilations I showed earlier. But, uh, even so, like, the, these, these old, earlier songs were really cool of Stoneman and Hiller. At least in my years back then, I thought it totally could have fit on Pale Folklore. And uh, then we also had the song Folorium Veridium, which was basically, I guess if you had to describe it nowadays, it was a Dungeon Sense style song and neoclassical, just really great, I loved it. Haunting Birds was an acoustic piece. And uh, then we had the song Kneel the Cross, which was, oh man, what a unbelievably influential song this turned out to be for me. I absolutely loved it, and after doing a lot of research, I found out that it was a cover from a neo-folk project called Sol Invictus. Um, I had never heard of, no, of uh, neo-folk, I had no idea what it was, but uh, this song ultimately got me into neo-folk music, to which uh, I am very grateful, because the neo-folk music would turn out to be a style of music that really just deeply resonated with my soul as well, and so genre I've continued to follow for over 20 years now, and I just, uh, I absolutely love it, man. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ugh, that's the interesting thing about Agalock, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, they explore such vast musical territory, and they just, uh, began getting into when I was young, they managed to get me into a lot of other uh, different music, and uh, for that I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, this has been re-released recently on cassette tape, and I think actually a vinyl as well. But uh, the original presents for this go for a pretty hefty amount on Discogs and eBay, but uh, shucks, I mean, I bought this for like 8 or $9 from the End Records website back in 2001, so really happy to have it. It's, uh, it's a cool little EP. It's no masterpiece, but uh, if you're a fan of the band, I'm quite sure you'd enjoy it. Um, after that, of course, uh, in 2002, and this album just turned 20 years old, so it's kind of cool to talk about it. Uh, well, it is uh, the Agalox The Mantle. Uh, oh man, what a... God, I was so looking forward to this album when it came out back in 2002. And kind of a funny story to have to tell you too is that uh, I bought this album kind of before a lot of other people were able to get it because the end records was at um, the Monkey Metal Fest in 2002 and they were selling it early. And I, I don't think the album came out until like another two months later or something like that. So it was really interesting to get it. And I remember as soon as I got home that evening, I put it on, but I had uh, not worn earplugs the whole day at the, the big uh, concert. So, so my ears were just buzzing. I couldn't even hear it. And I, initially, I wrote this album off because I, I wanted to sound so much like Pale Folklore. But uh, as I'd soon discover, it was. Musically speaking, it was probably a lot bigger and more dynamic than uh, Hail Folklore ever was, and it was ultimately the album that kind of really just pushed the band into greater territories when they started to, started to explore those more uh, avant-garde tendencies, you know, even further, uh, you know, the post, uh, post-rock post tendencies were there, the neo-folk stuff was there, some you know, kind of ambient stuff here and there too, uh, you know, acoustic stuff. It's a really, really unique a album. There's, you know, been a lot of other, so, you know, post black metal bands or whatever you want to call them have tried to recreate this sound, but ugh, no one's really ever, you know, it's, no one's ever come close. But you can definitely see the influence the mantle has had on uh, a lot of other bands out there. And uh, yeah, and then you know, the imagery is all just various. Uh, I guess you know. Pss, 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 stops in Portland, Oregon, and they've also sort of uh, called this like the Oregon album or something like that, or the Portland uh, uh, Portland album, I guess. So anyway, then, you know, again, talking about the image, you know, here is kind of when the point when the, some of the band members cut their hair short and, you know, obviously, you know, literally no metal look at all anymore at this point, you know, it's, they're, they're going for a much more kind of, I don't know, elegant, or maybe they're trying to go for like a neo-folkish kind of, I don't know, but definitely, you know, different from what was, you know, going on in Heavy Metal Underground at the time, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very special album, one that me and my wife just adore, absolutely, and, uh, one I'm quite sure I'll love for a long time to come. And of course, of course, we have the vinyl reissue once again from, uh, Profile More Records and Infinite Vinyl, as well as, uh, exclusively distributed in Europe by Graw Records, so here we have, you know, 
uh, again, kind of a, a variation of the uh, original album cover, so that's really cool. And then the back cover here. And this is, again, I looked this up on Discogs and it goes for a lot of money. I was actually really surprised at how much this stuff was going for. But, uh, yeah, man. And I think, if I am not mistaken, this has some print on the sleeves as well, all the lyrics. And is this a colored vinyl? I don't recall. Oh, yes. Yeah, the gray vinyl this time. Yeah, very cool. What does the other one look like? I haven't played it in a while, as you can probably guess. Picture of the band. Uh, I believe that is a bridge in somewhere in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, another gray vinyl. Very cool. Very, very cool. Gr great album. It's, uh, yeah, I'm. I will always really love this album. I mean, ultimately, uh, I mean, I know I say Pell is probably my favorite, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a fantastic album, too. One album I, I mean, this is an album I can put on, and any time of the year or mood, and I will enjoy it, but it definitely, again, has this more melancholy kind of sentiment to it, and it just, uh, it, if you are in that headspace, it really, uh, it really does wonders, I think, in a, a strange sort of way. So, yeah, Eagle Ox, The Mantle. February of 2004, Eagle Lock released The Grey, which was a two-track EP of uh, basically reworked uh, material from The Mantle. You have The Lodge Dismantled, which takes the song The Lodge from The Mantle and basically sort of turns it into a post-rock jam song. It, it's really different and really unique and uh, I always liked it a lot, but it seemed like at the time I remember just reading a lot of reviews, people were like, what is this? Like, why did they follow up the mantle with this? And I can understand that, especially when you get to uh, the second song, which is basically like a dark ambient noise scape, uh, and again, just, I guess, supposed to be a remix or a uh, variation of a song from Pale, or from, sorry, from the mantle. Um, Honestly, I've listened to the song so many times, and I, 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 I simply did not see the original song in it. I guess it must be in there somewhere, otherwise they wouldn't have called it a remix or whatever have you. But yeah, <laughs> but uh, interesting EP, you know. As again, you know, I'm following the band throughout their career, so it's just really interesting seeing the progression and just seeing, you know, the the risks in the past they're uh, willing to take just to, you know create their art and just, you know, get their message out there and just, you know, express themselves artistically. Uh, certainly not the best thing the band ever released, but uh, definitely worth uh, listening to if you uh, are into just really experimental and diverse musical styles. Or, yeah. But in the summer of 2004, Egalock released the Egalock and Nest split uh, picture disc 10-inch record. Um, this is another kind of interesting entry into their discography because, again, it was a completely like just non-metal release. It was too, uh, too basically just like acoustic neo-folk-styled songs from both bands. Um, so there's the front cover. Of that it's uh, it has artwork on both sides done by uh, uh, the artist from Nest, and he has this really cool, uh, I guess, like sort of. Yeah, it looks like colored pencil kind of artwork that was used, which is beautiful, really cool stuff. And this one also comes with like a postcard, yeah, with more artwork. Yeah, very, 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 very cool. And then again, a very limited item. I think this one was, uh, oh, it says right there. It was only a thousand copies, mine's number two or 240, yeah. So yeah, really cool. I mean, this was something, uh, I really like this a lot. It's, Oh, there's two, these four rehearsals here. There's two postcards, my bad. So there's another one, more artwork, and then uh, more information about the art piece. But uh, I was gonna say Nest, if you do not know them, they're a Finnish, uh, I guess neo-folk project would be the best way to describe them. They basically, instead of using an acoustic guitar, they use a Finnish instrument called the Kantalel, or Kantalel, I don't know how to say it, but it has, a, it's sort of like a, sort of like a lap harp kind of thing, and they make really beautiful music. I have all of their uh, uh, albums on CD, and it's just really great. So if you've never heard Nest, definitely look it up. So anyway, that is the Eagle Lock and Nest split picture disc. 
Well then, in August of 2006, the band released their third full length album, which is called Ashes Against the Grain. Um, Ashes Against the Grain is probably the band's most popular record, I think. And it, as far as I can remember, it was the album that kind of made the band just kind of blow up and suddenly there was a lot more people listening to them. And rightly so, it's a pretty accessible album while still keeping their distinctive post-black metal style, uh, you know, very much, uh, you know, as their own thing and just, uh, but, you know, yeah, it's like a much more accessible album, not maybe as eccentric or artsy as uh, The Mantle was. Um, the version I have right here is a promo version, and uh, I, I got this, if memory serves me, about a month before the actual album came out. I got it because I was doing my zine, Lunar Hypnosis, back then, so that was super cool to get an early version. I mean, you know, just, I mean, a band you love and you're going to hear their music, like, a month before anyone else. That was so cool back then, and I mean, because of all the file sharing and whatnot, you know, kind of stuff, and I, I hate the way, like, nowadays bands always gotta put, like, three or four singles out before the fucking album's even released, like, it just, uh, I don't, I don't know why bands do it, but, like, all of them do, and I think it's probably more the labels than anything, but, I don't know, I just don't like it, I mean, there was just, you know, I hadn't heard a single song from this until I got this promo, and just, Again, when I first heard this, it really, like, I think I wanted to sound like the Mantle, because at that point I was so in love with the Mantle, and then this was, you know, another step in a different direction while still being Agalak, but definitely something different, yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, I actually have three different versions of this album, and we'll, uh, we'll show all those in a little while. There's the CD. Oh, Tiki Torch? Nah. <laughs> in the back. And uh, yeah, as I said, this was the promo version, so the booklet is quite different. And actually, as it stands, I do not own the standard version of this album, but uh, we'll see uh, the other versions I have uh, very soon. And then, you know, instead of having a booklet with lyrics, it has, you know, a picture of the band, uh, you know, has their bio here and everything. And this was also the album that welcomed in uh, Chris Green as a drummer. The, uh, previous to that, uh, John Hom had just done all the drumming and, you know, they weren't able to play live. And then when Chris joined, they were able to finally play live. And got a promo sheet I kept all the years. I used to have so many of these promo sheets from uh, the end records and just, you know, all the labels and stuff. And I throw them all away years ago, I don't. Uh, <laughs> to say the least, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, that is at least one version of Ashes Against the Green. But yeah, I always like this album a lot. It... it it's it's much more you know I maybe you know easy to listen to easy to get through you know songs are um, I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly but uh, yeah <laughs> I guess maybe you know what I'm trying to say if you've heard it it's definitely the album that helped really define I think that you know the post black metal sound that's become quite popular in the past ten years and you know uh, you know even nowadays it's up uh, here. Pictures of old band, really cool. And again, really, uh, really special photography as usual from Agalock. More printing on there. That's, uh, I believe, well, you know, that's lyrics. Another image there. I think this is a blue vinyl. No, this is the black vinyl. Yes, black vinyl. Again, this one goes for a pretty good chunk of monies on Discog, so that's cool, I guess. <laughs> Did I have any plans to sell it, of course, but, you know. Here's this one, a picture of the torch, and uh, some uh, recording information, and there's fire burning there. And, you know, I think a lot easier than the black vinyl again. Yeah, super cool. So yeah, Ashes Against the Green. Um, what is my favorite song on this record? Or, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of good songs in this, this record, and I've always sort of, uh, what is the song called now? Uh, oh, Fire Above, Ice Below, or Not Unlike the Leaves. Just really great songs, you know. Fire Above, Ice Below has a sort of slow build, this much more epic kind of territory, and but sort of dooming characteristics to it. Then, then unlike the not unlike the waves, is a much more catchy kind of, I, I guess, just straightforward uh, post black metal song. It's, it's it's a really great song. They made a music video for it too, which you can look up. And yeah, <laughs> that is the second version of Ashes Against the Grain I own. And then, and then we have the 
wooden box edition. Yeah. Um, I have to stress that I didn't buy these various special editions because I just, you know, absolutely love this album or anything. It's just kind of that, like, they got released and I was just like, well, fuck, I gotta buy this, you know, because it was just so cool. I mean, a wooden box CD. I, I never heard of such a thing back then, you know. So cool. So, uh, and then this wooden box, what you get is, um, well, I guess technically I do have the the official um, version of the album on CD, this version here. But you also get, uh, get an Agalock sticker, get some uh, photos, band photo by the fire, skull, and then, and then most importantly, some ash from the fire perhaps uh, in that photo. Um, I guess some versions of, the, of this box that also came with, uh, I believe, some bones, so that's kind of cool. And then here's the, uh, you know, the official CD pressing. Comes in this digi pack, and I actually haven't looked through this in ages, so I want to see what the differences are compared to that promo version I just showed. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of differences just yet. There's a CD, let's see what the book is. I don't know, I've never taken a book out of here. <laughs> Alright, first row of both of us, perhaps. Oh, cool. Alright, I got a lyric. So it kind of it kind of mirrors the vinyl version a bit. More fire. Page I missed there, a couple pages. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, a picture of the band, chording information, and yeah. So yeah, that is the uh, special wooden box version of Ashes Against the Grain. Uh, surely, I, th I think, you know, the element really just kind of, you know, again, as I said, kind of propelled Agalock to the next thing. They became uh, not necessarily a household name, but they started touring around then, and they were able to get out there on the road, and eventually they became uh, pretty popular in a lot of European countries, and they were often asked to come back and perform there, which I'm sure they loved, and uh, yeah, so... That's Eagleock's Ashes Against the Grain. Following Ashes Against the Grain, Eagleock released the White EP, which is a companion piece to the Gray EP that came out a few years earlier. Um, musically speaking, uh, the White is vastly superior, as it's basically a collection of neo-folk and dark ambient and sort of, uh, I guess, kind of dungeon synth -y kind of tracks. It is, uh, it is a phenomenal EP, which also has uh, a direct influence from the Wicker Man movie, which is... Uh, old uh, Scottish movie that was from, I believe, 1972 that had Christopher Lee in it. Just a phenomenal film, and it's, there's samples and all that kind of stuff in here, and it, it's kind of interesting how uh, uh, influential that movie was on uh, the neo-folk scene. It's, I mean, if you if you know, you know, but uh, if not, like, it, it was huge, and this is just, uh, you know, another example of that, basically, how big an influence it had. So, yeah, and then, uh, a booklet here. I mean, just just beautiful, beautiful music on this one. I absolutely love everything about this EP. This has been re-released um, on vinyl, I think, maybe even tape recently. I'd have to double check, but uh, yeah, they had, they had quite a few uh, guests on this album too. They had uh, uh, well, no one really notable, I guess, but <laughs> quite a few different guests played different stuff, and then had this. OB strip, which a lot of the, uh, I guess, Japanese CDs have and stuff like that. Don't really know why, but it did. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I love this record, though. Uh, my favorite has always been, uh, man, uh, so we, the Birch Black, which is a really cool, really sort of acoustic and has some electric guitar. I, I mean, it's hard to describe, it's a really, really cool summer. The Isle of Summer is just a real kind of chill acoustic piece, and then uh, Pantheus is more of a dark ambient dungeon synth ish kind of track, I guess. I don't know how else really to really describe it. And then uh, Sovillo Rune, and that's probably like my favorite song, just a very, very melancholy neo folk piece, probably. I mean, as far as any uh, acoustic songs are concerned in Anglox, it's by far the best one they ever released. Just, just beautiful, gorgeous. Uh, a wonderful song and I absolutely love it and uh, yeah um, I again I know I've seen this stuff going on discogs yeah probably before all the recent repressings it had gone for a lot of money and rightly so it is a just awesome awesome EP so the white
Following the White was a series of singles and compilations, as well as the band's first DVD, which I regrettably never picked up and is probably now uh, out of print and hard to get. But nevertheless, we're moving on to 2010 when the band released their fourth album, Marrow of the Spirit. And the version I have here is the uh, black etched uh, jewel case version, which is limited to 2,000 copies. Um, I can't for the life of me remember which label released this, but it was a real pain in the ass just to get it into my collection. I There was something, I don't even remember, but something where like, it just it stuff wasn't getting shipped out on time, and it was just like, the album had already been out for like three months before I finally got this in my hands, and I didn't, you know, want to cheat and go buy the album or whatever, you know what I'm saying, because I had this special edition coming. And I also... <laughs> Uh, had ordered a t-shirt at that time for the, with the album's artwork on it, and I had ordered a, a large, but said they sent me a small, and, uh, well, that was useless to me. So I ended up reselling that on eBay a few years later, because, yeah, completely useless to a guy that wears a size large. Yeah. But anyway, uh, more specifically, you know, talking about uh, <laughs> this fourth album, uh, again, you know, a great progression of styles here, and very, very, very good album. Uh, I think this is probably uh, the realm that kind of has a more kind of similar sound throughout. There's not, they're not as adventurous, maybe, but nevertheless, it still is a pretty diverse album. As there's like some, you know, a lot of post characteristics, uh, some UFO characteristics. There's some more ambient, even kind of like kraut rock kind of characteristics in the, the Black Lake Nidsting song. Some real interesting vocal parts too. It's a really cool album. There's some really great riffs on this album. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, but yeah, I, I felt like kind of like when this album came out, like I, I kind of I, initially I didn't like it too much. It, it, it had to grow on me. It took a few years, but I, I inevitably really did like this album. It out of the first four albums, I don't. I think it's. I shouldn't say they're worse, but it's. Not, it's the one I would put at the bottom as far as their first four albums are concerned. But uh, still, there's some really, like I said, really great songs. Uh, the, I, I, I mean, it's cool. It's a cool album. It's just, uh, it wasn't as diverse as I wanted it to be. I think I, at that point in time, I, I had a caught in that point where like, I, just, I was like, what's Igalak going to do next? You know, the EPs are like teasers and stuff like that. Like, what's going to be the new album? This, this album kind of seemed a little more straightforward, so to speak. And it, it's not a bad thing at all. It's just maybe not what I expected out of it. But uh, nevertheless, a, a cool album. And I have this rare version here, which again, probably goes for a lot on Discogs and eBay, but uh, you can't have it. So this is Igalak's The Mirror of the Spirit. Well then, moving on to 2012, the band has released another compilation. This is the White Division Grey compilation. And essentially what this does is it gathers, gathers together the White EP and the Grey EPs and makes them available again because they've been out of print for a couple of years at this point. And then you get some basically like a couple bonus tracks. One is uh, basically Ness doing a variation of an Egalock song and the rest are remixes and I, I have to be totally honest with you, uh, well, they're not very good. It's, uh, I bought this believe this is when I saw Eagle Lock for the second time and uh, I was I mean I had no idea this was even gonna be released I just got to the show and looked at the merch table and there it was and I was like what is this so I just that's how I was so I just bought it but you know even though I realized when I, and that I had all the stuff already sitting at home for me it wasn't really a lot of new stuff to discover but uh, yeah we have you know uh, artwork you know all kind of linked again to the white EP and then uh, the gray EP later on and recording information. Yeah, the 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 remixes are definitely the most experimental and interesting songs Agalock ever did. And I mean, rightly so, they're, they're remixes and that's bound to happen. But uh, yeah, <laughs> not, not necessarily the most interesting tracks from the band's discography. And there's the, uh, the Grey CD. So yeah, that is White Division Grey. Later on in 2012, Agalock would release Faustian Echoes, which is uh, probably the most black metal sounding piece of music they ever released. It is uh, for sure post black metal uh, at its peak, I think. It's just a phenomenal, well, not so much an EP, but a single, but it's 21 minutes long, so call it whatever you will. But uh, 
I actually had a, no idea this was coming out, and I was actually in Finland at the time, and one of my friends over there, he kind of like was like looking at Facebook or something like that, and he's like, oh yeah, Agalock's releasing this uh, new EP today or something, or soon, I don't really recall, we, we were drinking the whole time, and a lot of it's just a big blur, but uh, I was super stoked because I had no idea it was coming out, and I was just, you know, getting hyped to hear more new music from, uh, from my, probably shouldn't have dropped that. Uh, just, you know, hearing more new music from one of my uh, favorite bands. And uh, this one has uh, another really, really large Obi strip. Uh, I don't know if vinyls typically have Obi strips, but they certainly do here. And then what do we have here? Oh, a download code, which I don't think I've ever used. I'm not going to actually show that because I think I'm going to add it to my band camp. Cool. Okay, uh, <laughs> catalog. So yeah, Frosty Necklace, it's definitely the most black metal sounding piece I think Agalock ever released. You know, just pure post black metal. Um, but again, you know, this is a band that helped define that style and just really kind of, you know, bring it to the masses, so to speak, uh, or at least, you know, the, more to the metal underground. It's a really great song. There's some samples, there's some really brutal drums. It was at this point in time that uh, their new drummer, actually, no, Aesop, their drummer Aesop Decker, he had joined on Mirror of the Spirit, I think, actually, I don't know. I'll have to look that up and <laughs> figure that out. But I think this was the first thing, single he played on. And he was much more, I think, really diverse and intricate just fast playing German it really shows and uh, yeah it's a really great song and just uh, you know another real fine awesome piece to have in my Eagle collection. Well then we come to May of 2014 Eagle Lock has now released their fifth album The Serpent and the Sphere. Um, ultimately this was yes the last Eagle Lock album and it is an album that for me has just as hard as I've tried to get into some of them, I just cannot get into it. It has always, to me, felt like an album that was just kind of like the, the band members phoned their parts in and then they went about touring and then two years after this album came out, the band broke up and it, it kind of, at least in my opinion, just kind of shows like a band that kind of, it, it feels like just the creative energy they had, you know, coming out of each other, just it wasn't there anymore. It, it's, just, it's a very straightforward album. It's very just... Uh, typically post black metalish, whatever Agalock is, you know, their style. It's just, it's very straightforward. I mean, then there's a couple acoustic pieces that are uh, uh, played by this French Canadian musician named Nathaniel. I can't remember his last name, but he's got a project called Musk Ox, which is really worth looking up. But, uh, I, I, I always thought these kind of acoustic versions he had contributed to this album were kind of just eh, kind of boring. I, I I have tried you know for almost ten years now to get into this album, and I I just I don't know I cannot can do it. Uh, the best song on the whole album is uh, Plateau of the Ages, which is just sort of a long kind of you know progressive post instrumental song, and it's it's really good. It's the best song on the album, but uh, the rest of the album just like even just thinking about it, I can't even like really remember a lot of parts of the song because it's just kind of forgettable in the grand scheme of things. And Dark Matter Gods is okay, but yeah, I don't know. I just have never been able to really get into this album. Maybe you like it more, but uh, yeah. But uh, nevertheless, you know, as it goes with Agalock, very, very cool packaging, very cool graphics. Um, yeah, let's take a look at that booklet here. I got that sort of, you know, cool looking, uh, yeah, whatever, see-through booklet, or I don't know what the hell you want to describe that exactly. So yeah, big booklet here with lots of artwork, uh, the lyrics, of course, and it's been a long time since I looked at this. <laughs> More lyrics, pictures, artwork. Yeah, they always had really cool artwork in all the Ecolock albums. I always liked it quite a bit. Always really cool band photos, which were, uh, at least in the, the last couple of years, uh, courtesy of John's wife, Velita Thorson. Yeah, really cool. Really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately an album that, uh, it seemed like it was pretty well received at the time, but just, uh, I don't know, I could never really get into this album. So, yeah, and that's... You know, of course, unfortunately, Agalock broke up two years after this album, and uh, it's not exactly, you know, the big triumphant album you would have thought they would have ended their career with. I mean, uh, 
I know after they broke up, a lot of the members had said that, that you know they had a lot of material that was going to uh, be recorded for the sixth uh, Eagle Eye album, but obviously that never happened. And uh, I guess if you're watching this video, you probably know that there was a lot of drama that uh, when Eagle Eye broke up, John made some pretty ridiculous statements on Facebook, and it all went viral as these things do, and it became this big sort of you know, publicity thing. And then shortly after uh, the band broke up, uh, John continued on with a new band called Pelorian, and the other three members from Eagle Eye went on to this band called Cor Corada, if I'm saying it right, I don't know. But uh, Pelorian was kind of, kind of, I think probably best comparable to the Fausty and Echo single. It was good, but it just, it kind of sounded like Egalock without the magic. Like, I, I liked it, I just, I don't know, I, when it first came out, I had every intention to buy it. I, didn't buy it, I just never got around to it. Eventually I just streamed it and I was like, eh, it's okay, I just, I don't know, I never bought it. And then, yeah, a couple of years after that, the other guys released this album called, or this band called Corada, which was just bad. Just really bad. Just hipster, uh, progressive metal. I, I, I hate it. I thought it was just awful. And again, I never bought that one. So it was kind of a lot of disappointment after Igalak. Uh, you know, came to their end. I was really hoping that, you know, maybe as solo musicians and, uh, you know, forming new bands, they'd come up with something really cool. And, you know, it's not to say uh, some of the stuff John Holmes done, has done solo isn't bad, but uh, I just sort of, sort of expected these musicians to carry on making just really triumphant, you know, awesome, atmospheric, emotional music. And then after Igalot came to their end, that just never really happened. So to conclude this video, we're going to talk about some projects that came before and during and ultimately after the existence of Agalock. And we're going to start way back in the early days with an old project known as Uncomposing. Uncomposing was an early solo project from John Hong, which was released in 1994. And uh, his one and only demo called Northernmost Epic is kind of this weird mixture of like... I guess... It, some sort of European, like Scandinavian, melodic, death, blackish metal intermingled with something that kind of has hints of what would later on be found in Agalock. It, it's it's no masterpiece, it's not, and I've actually, Don Anderson told me once that John actually uh, wanted to destroy all the copies of this because he hated it so much. But uh, for something released in 1994, it, it's pretty interesting, pretty diverse. It's just what you kind of get on this this or this tape is just uh, kind of the early shades of what would you know eventually become the the first Agalock demos and uh, you know, inevitably uh, pale folklore. So I got this demo from a friend of mine about ten years ago, and I, he just had a, just this huge, huge archive of old demos he had traded back that day. And when I saw this in his pile, I just was like, holy shit! And he was selling them for like two dollars each or something like that, and just. I really, really was stoked to hear this, and but you know, as I said, ultimately it's nothing to get uh, too excited about. But it's just interesting seeing the kind of you know where these guys came from, and you know, ultimately, uh, you know, John Hom is something he was doing earlier in his years. It's kind of just fold out with all the lyrics too. So you know, for a self release demo back in the early '90s, pretty, pretty cool thing. I noticed something too that he doesn't refer to himself as John Holm here. I, I always kind of wondered if uh, John Lewis is his real name and John Holm is just like his like, stage last name or something. I, I don't know, I always wondered about that, but uh, I've seen a, a different demo too where he was referred to as John Ham. so I don't know what to think about that. But uh, yeah, uncomposing, just uh, no masterpiece and I'd be damned if he would find a copy uh, for a reasonable price. and. I don't think anyone's ever actually uploaded this to uh, YouTube either, so I'll have to see about doing that someday, because uh, this is definitely uh, something that should be heard, you know, if not, uh, you know, I don't know, in the grand scheme of things, people will really dig it, but definitely Agalock fans would definitely really find this to be interesting. Another often overlooked long gone side project or project of Agalock members is Susurus Inanus, which was a project between original Agalock member Shane Brayer and uh, Agalock bassist Jason William Walton. Basically, the music on display here is heavily influenced by, like, 
uh, neoclassical dark wave bands like Arcana and uh, a lot of stuff that was kind of on Cold Made Industry in the late 90s. Or to be more specific, the songs sound a lot like the kind of ambient and dungeon synthy tracks that are found on the Igalock demos and Pale Folklore because Shane Breer had actually uh, composed all those, and uh, yeah, it's very much in that sort of neoclassical synth style. And uh, Jason told me years and years ago that they actually had uh, a contract, or at least a full-length album with uh, Cold Spring Records from England back in the late 90s, but because of Agalock's priorities, they just never, they just never had time to do it, and I guess, uh, Shane Breyer was more of the mastermind of the project, more so than uh, Jason was. And at some point in time, I believe Shane you know, he quit Agalock after Pale Folklore, and then he went on to you know, college or something like that, and became like a college professor or something like that, and, you know, completely left all the music behind. So obviously, you know, really early on, you know, because of Agalock's priorities, and then Shane disappearing from music, they were never able to complete a full-length album. But it really, really would have been cool to hear something like this back in like. 99, 2000, a full length. Um, it's, it's definitely a more kind of raw-ish, uh, you know, dark wave neoclassical style, but I really, really dig it. Um, in particular, the song Such As This Water, it's just a really beautiful song, just, you know, lovely piano, some great vocals. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you know the style, you would definitely enjoy this. I believe uh, if Jason William Malton's Bandcamp page is still up, he has this up here for uh, downloads, so definitely, definitely check this out if you've never heard it. Then we have Sculptured, the band Don Anderson was playing in just before he joined Agalock. So Sculptured is, uh, how do you describe Sculptured? Sculptured is sort of a progressive melodic death metal with jazz influences, yeah. Um, this was one of the first heavy metal bands I ever heard that was using like brass instruments in their, in in their music and I thought it was just just really freaking cool and really uh, different. I mean, and still to this day, there hasn't really been a, a lot of bands that have used brass instruments in their music. So that, that, that you know, this was released in I believe 1999, and just uh, yeah, just a really unique special album. Um, later on, when the band recorded their second album, uh, John Hobbin, Jason William Malted would join the band, but uh, I've I've sort of it's hard for me to sort of pick which of these early albums I like more because they're both really, really good and really unique albums. But uh, it's interesting too because I mean these guys were all, you know, just I think teenagers still when this was released. I, I believe Don was only like, uh, I think he was a few, like three or four years younger than the rest of the guys in Agalox. So yeah, he was just like a teenager when this was released in the late 90s. And uh, yeah, it's a great, great album if you've never heard it. Definitely look it up. And then uh, I believe in 1998, the, as I said, John Hom and Jason William Malton joined the band and they did uh, Apollo Ends. And this is very much kind of the same style, but maybe more progressive metal and, you know, more, more usage of brass instruments. It's a really, really, really good album. Although I have to say I was always very confused by the album cover, why it was uh, just a small little nuclear blast or whatever going on. I'm not exactly sure what the hell happened there. I think I read something that there was some sort of misprint like that was supposed to be the album cover or something like that and that was supposed to be on the back. I, I don't know. But it would have made a lot more sense obviously. But anyway, you know, this is a really, really great album. Just great use of just great riffs, great songs. And I've always sort of like thought this was like a, like a summer album. I think it's just because uh, Back in the day when I first got this, a friend of mine, like we'd just go driving around like the country and just, you know, listen to this album. It was a, it was a really cool album. It has a very, it has a warm kind of, you know, summery kind of feel to it. It's just a really great album. Great riffs, great songs. Uh, there's also a sort of post-rockish sort of noisecape song on here too, which again was sort of like my introduction to that kind of music and just, uh, you know, again, seeing these kind of connections that, you know, the Eagle Lock and the Eagle Lock projects had just this big influence on me and my taste in music. Another project of Jason William Walton that he did for about 10 years was called Nothing. And he had uh, numerous full-length albums and compilations released, and all of them are very, very good. Uh, it's a tape compilation. I'll kind of show the layouts of all these just as I'm talking about this. But uh, uh, this first one here is basically, I, I guess, sort of a demo compilation. It's a very peculiar recording that has 
characteristics of like industrial music, noise, there's some sort of like trance music, and there's also just, uh, it's really peculiar, just I guess electronic music would be the best way to put it. It's all over the place, it's very, very interesting, and it's no masterpiece, but for the sake of just being weird and different, it's it's really unique, and I, I, I like, it, like it for that. Also, interestingly, uh, John Holm has a small uh, bit of input into this record. I believe he plays some guitars, and his voice is present here, too. And then uh, Michelle Luce, who uh, does nothing, but is just a cover model, but somehow she gets like she gets got credited as part of the band, so it's kind of interesting. But uh, that was the first uh, proper thing that nothing released, and then he continued on with uh, what is just, uh, to me, an absolute masterpiece. Uh, the Grey Subaudible, which was released by Ibon Records back in, uh, I believe, 2001. This is a really great album of just sort of like uh, <sighs> dark ambient, industrial, power electronics, dark wave, and just something not easily describable. It is a very unique, very dark album, and I absolutely love it. This album, uh, in particular, was a huge, huge influence on me uh, to, later on in life, create dark ambient and experimental music. Uh, just a phenomenal album that I heard a couple of years ago was going to get reissued on vinyl, but I don't know if it ever happened, so I should probably contact Jason and see what he says about that. It's it's interesting. There's lots of really uh, uh, it's it's interesting now because it kind of, from my perspective, it kind of has uh, this sort of storyline of someone going through like stages of death through infection and stuff like that, and it has all these really interesting lyrics and vocal styles, and it, it's you know again I can't really simply uh, you know place into a simple genre or whatever, but very unique. If you like dark ambient music or you know, basically anything on like the Cold Made Industry label, he would absolutely love this album. And then, uh, he has this album also on Ibon Records called Silence Came Back in Filling Jagged uh, Spaces, which is a much more, uh, I guess I would say, just much more straightforward dark ambient album. If you just like kind of more chill dark ambient, you know, again, kind of uh, comparable to stuff that was on Cold Made Industry, you would probably dig this, but much more laid back and you know chill than uh, uh, the greatest of audible was. No noise characteristics here or anything like that. Yeah, really good. I'm like, actually, I haven't listened to this in a while. I should probably do that soon. <laughs> but yeah, really cool album. And then, uh, I don't know what it was, maybe like five years ago, uh, this compilation called The Spine Overshadowed by the Rope was released. And it's uh, two cassettes uh, worth of just more. Uh, uh, experimental, uh, it's basically various unreleased songs and some of them are hard to get EPs that nothing released during their lifetime. Has uh, two J cards with all the information. I haven't listened to this nearly enough either since when I first got this album I uh, just didn't really have a very well functioning cassette player so it wasn't until uh, some years later I actually got to hear it properly but yeah, really, really, you know, again, if you're into, you know, more experimental and dark ambient noise music, this is very, very much worth checking out, uh, or the Nothing Project in general. And of course, uh, Nothing should not be uh, confused with that sort of, uh, I don't know what they are, shoegaze, emo band, or whatever that got popular like in the last 10 years. No, it's a totally different project, so don't uh, link the projects, so they have nothing to do with each other. Nothing is totally different and definitely uh, a unique creation and something that uh, only Jason William Walton could do, I think, because I've never heard anything else exactly like it. And then another really interesting project from Jason William Walton is his Especially Likely Slot project. Um, how do you, spe how do you explain Especially Likely Slot? It's basically the sort of... It's a project sort of influenced by... I guess stuff like Mr. Bungle, Fossil Fuel, The Residence, just really just weird music, but he takes it like, you know, really seriously, which is what's, what's actually kind of funny because I don't know how you can kind of take music, but it's like, when this, this is actually accomplished, I used to have the first album, but I, I guess I sold it at some point, which is too bad because now I really want to hear it, but it's a compilation of some stuff that he did like in the late 90s, and I just, 
take a look at the song titles there if you can, if it comes, if you can see it well enough, and it, it'll kind of give you some idea. It's very humorous, very silly, and then, you know, if you know those bands I mentioned earlier, uh, very much influenced by that kind of stuff. Musically, it's all over the place. There's a lot of samples from, like, The Simpsons and stuff like that, and Red and Stimpy, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was released on Jason's own Audio Savant record label, and uh, Audio Savant was sort of an experimental electronic label that he was doing back probably between like 2003 to 2006 and he had like, I don't know, maybe like 10 releases, 12 releases, I don't know, not a whole lot, but he, he sent me most of them back in the day. And there was also back in the day, there was a sort of a, a joke EP that was released at the same time. And as I recall, it was something like a CD that would had just had like peanut butter or something smeared all over it and I got, he sent it to me for review in my zine and I was just like, Okay, this is hilarious, but, but how do you review just like a, a tray card filled with peanut butter or whatever? I, I, I don't know. It was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was ridiculous, needless to say. But especially like the sauce has these, a sloth has these really weird sort of like, I don't know, it sounds like a little eight-year-old kid that sort of just doodling around his keyboard just making crazy stuff, but then... Uh, Lots of other weird influences make their way into it. Some some of the songs later on that uh, John Hom and Don Anderson also contribute to, as well as some other people that are kind of linked to those guys. Uh, it's very, very weird, but I don't know. Uh, there's a, some part of me that just really digs this weirdness, and I, again, I can't believe I sold the first down. But anyway, the, this is called uh, Round the Corner Fudge is Made. It's a special likely, th likely sloth, why can't I say that? All right, so both while Agalock was active and uh, subsequently after Agalock broke up and Pelorian broke up, John Hom was releasing solo music and uh, basically it was in sort of a post-rock, neoclassical, dark, ambient, drone style. And this tape right here, which is called uh, 122012 and 042911 is basically, I think, one of his first releases, maybe the very first one. It's basically, as I said, kind of a mixture of dark ambient, drone, neoclassical, uh, just experimental music. I, I don't really know how to how to really label it. As, again, I've never really heard anything immediately just like it, but uh, I know when it was announced, I was pretty stoked on it. So I was like, well, shit, John doing solo stuff, that's cool. But then at the same time, you know, it kind of also, when R starts doing their own solo music, uh, separate from their main bands, like, the kind of, it kind of sends a message out there, like, to the other guys, like, okay, I'm kind of bored with what I'm doing this main band, I don't, I don't need you guys, or whatever, I can do my own solo music, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, I guess a lot of people do, uh, you know, solo music for various different reasons, but, uh, you know, who knows, maybe that was just sort of early indication that John was eventually gonna, you know, move away from the other guys and, you know, do his own thing. So then, two years ago, he released, uh, what the hell is this album called? Uh, 1895 Cast, 1865, 1895 Cast Iron Blood. And this is, again, you know, very uh, droney, dark ambient, but with still some metal characteristics to it. It's, uh, it has this sort of Old West theme to it, as I guess John is a big fan of that era. It has some very cool artwork, but again, largely it would probably be best to just kind of label this into the dark ambient drone. Um, field, even though there are some, uh, you know, metal influences and some stuff that does, you know, again, kind of sound like uh, Agalock. Um, considering the fact that John can play guitars, drums, vocals, and bass, it would, I would, I wouldn't mind seeing him do a black metal album, you know, just a total solo thing someday. I don't know if he will. I think he's more into doing, you know, his art stuff and then just, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, his kind of music, he's kind of moved past the whole metal and black metal thing, I guess. But, uh, nevertheless, uh, hopefully he does do something metal again. And then, uh, I guess it was about a year or so ago, um, John Holm teamed up with Matthias Grasshow and did uh, a collaboration CD called Opolis. And this is just pure drone music, it's just, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Matthias on his uh, keyboards and John his guitar drones and stuff like that, just making very droney, very atmospheric stuff. This is just totally dreamy stuff. Yeah, John signed it for me, so that was pretty cool. Um, definitely stuff that you you know you, you got you get, you're gonna zone out to while uh, listening to it. You know, very long songs, very dreamy, very dark, but still very hypnotic and uh, just really interesting music and. Yeah, that's kind of uh, 
No, now that I think about it, that is actually uh, all of the Egalock music I own and all of the uh, Egalock projects I own. So, hope you guys have enjoyed watching this. I, if you like this, I can definitely, you know, talk about other bands in the future that I have uh, several releases from. I think that'd be interesting. Uh, other than that, uh, let me know if you like Egalock. Let me know what kind of stuff you have. I realize there are some holes in my collection, but... As I said, I've never really actively seeked out any of uh, these Egalock albums. I just, they just, they were released and I bought them as they came out. In fact, the last Egalock thing I bought was the uh, Serpent and the Sphere album. That was way back 2014. That's been it. You know, everything else I bought before then. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, as usual, thanks for watching Joe's Metal Man Cave. I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you next time.